Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who learned the facts of life from watching the facts of life. He is the captain. Yeah, you might have had a crush on Blair or Tootie, but my money was on Edna. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are very excited to be featuring Up High by our good friends at the Terrapin Beer Company. This High Five California style IPA leads you down a road of pure adrenaline and beauty. The citrusy hops will keep you in awe sip after sip. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And we want to give a big cheers to our good friends who contributed to this week's beer fund first up cheers to laura and steph in fargo north dakota and a big shout out to Catherine in castro valley california next up we have a cheers to my man zano from the seedy part of parts unknown zano he has a three dollar parking fine he owes us for and a big we like your jib to julia and will in raleigh north carolina Here we go, Captain. We have Kimberly from Adena, Minnesota. And last but certainly not least, a cheers to Brianna and Chester in North Carolina. Lots of love coming from North Carolina. Thank you to everyone who went to truecrimegarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fund. We are forever grateful. And a quick Parts Unknown announcement. If you rented the movie Porky's or the movie Dirty Dancing from the Clubhouse, please return them immediately. All right, Captain. All right, everybody in the garage, everybody out there in wonderful listener land, that is enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Record stereophonically as well as monorally, bringing the new thrill of living stereo to home recording. Now, high fidelity music at the new low speed of only three and three quarters inches per second. One whole hour of stereophonic music or two hours monaural in a single tape cartridge. In the past, playing a vital role in developing a dramatic new product to further and advance a great new industry, the tape cartridge. April 23rd, 1974. The Ogden Standard Examiner, page one, headline read, Three murdered as burglars invade Ogden record shop. Manhunt on. The newspaper only cost the locals 10 cents for the daily copy to read about the horrific murders. It was not just the murders that terrified the city located at the foot of of the Wasatch Mountains. It was a fact that the killers were still on the loose and their identities unknown to law enforcement and the community. Portions of Corey Peterson's article read, Police throughout Utah are searching for men who used guns in the killing of three persons after invading an Ogden record shop. All were shot in the back of the head. The chief of detectives in the Ogden Police Department said all of his men and all officers of the newly formed tactical squad have been assigned to the case. He called the crime a continuing one, lasting several hours. The gruesome affair apparently started about 7 p.m. when two men broke into the hi-fi shop. Some of the victims were tied up and taken downstairs. One of the victims was found almost completely nude. Police said robbery was the primary motive. 
No motive for the shootings and the torture had been discovered. The Utah Highway Patrol said police are looking for two vans. One described as a yellow late model van and the other as a dark blue Chevrolet van. The suspects are considered to be armed and extremely dangerous. Sometime after 9 p.m. on Monday, April 22nd, 1974, Police are responding to what was labeled at the time as an unknown trouble call. They found a man in very bad shape in a parking lot behind the hi-fi shop located at 2323 Washington Boulevard in Ogden, Utah. The hi-fi shop was a successful store that sold expensive stereo equipment and records. The man in the parking lot was 43-year-old Oren Walker. Oren said he had been shot in the back of the head and tortured by two men who were robbing the store. He said after the men left, he had managed to crawl from out of the basement of the store, making it all the way to the parking lot. There were other victims inside, likely all dead. Police searched the area and the store. They found no signs of the two assailants cited by Oren but the police are going to find four more victims in the basement of the hi-fi shop. Regarding the call to police, the story goes like this, Captain, that someone living nearby or working nearby saw Oren in the parking lot of the hi-fi shop and saw him to be in very bad shape. They call it into the police department, and that's why the the call went out as an unknown trouble call. Mm -hmm. They're responding to something going on, but they don't know what it is. Around this same time, Oren's wife and son arrived on the scene really just seconds before or seconds after the police. There are two rather conflicting stories here. The one we just told you about was from the Ogden Standard Examiner, April 23, 1974 newspaper. The next is from the Crime Classification Manual, a standard system for investigating and classifying violent crimes, a book that is the result of a 10-year project by the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. There, it says that around 10.30 p.m., police responded to a call from Oren's wife and one of his sons who went to the store when they became concerned that Oren and their other son, this is Stanley Walker, did not come home. In this version, which both are, to be fair, both versions are repeated in other publications, but these two happen to be the ones that I chose to list here. In this version, Oren Walker's son could hear disturbing noises coming from the basement, so he either broke down the door or broke into the shop and found his father unconscious at the foot of the basement stairs. How they were found is not really important. What is important is is that they were found, and found relatively soon after the attacks. This most definitely prevented further loss of life. There were five victims total, with at least four of them being found in the basement of the hi-fi shop. Two of the victims were dead when police arrived. Two more were clinging to life, and Orn was in very bad shape as said. The three living victims were immediately transferred to the nearest hospital. Now, just to give a quick little reference here, Captain, in 1974, about 65,000 people lived in the greater Ogden area. Our five victims are Michelle Ansley, Byron Courtney Nesbitt, Carol Nesbitt, Oren Walker, and Stanley Walker. Michelle and Stanley were the two that were already expired by the time the police arrived. They were both shot in the back of the head and likely died instantly or very quickly. Michelle was 18 years old. She was planning on getting married in August of that same year. She was newly employed at the shop. She had only worked there for about a week or so. Stanley was 20 years old and employed at the store as well. 
I believe he was in more of a managerial role or at least in that type of role that evening. He likely was in charge of closing the store that night. The terrible and just really strange thing is, and we've seen this in some other tragedies, it's been reported that the two that were working that night, Michelle and Stanley, were actually filling in for some other employees. Right. That, we hear that a lot in cases. But this is also scary, too, because even in a situation like when I used to work at a bank, you're not so worried so much about the individual coming in and passing a note saying, you know, I want all your money. It's it's the takeover of the store. Mm-hmm. So at some point, this store, this hi-fi store has been taken over by how many people we don't even know. Carol Nesbitt was alive when responders were on the scene. However, she died shortly after arriving at the hospital. Carol was shot in the back of the head and she was 52 years old at this time. Byron Courtney Nesbitt was just 16 years old. He was shot in the head as well, in the back of the head. He survived. He was in a coma and was in the hospital for 266 days before he could go home. Now, I do want to point out before we move on that Byron and his father share the same first name, so he went by Courtney his middle name, Courtney Nesbitt. So if you hear us call this young man Courtney, that's why we are doing that. Oren Walker was alive and in the hospital. As said, he was 43 years old at the time of the attack, but he was alive and actually he was in considerably better shape than Courtney Nesbitt was. He was able to tell police what went down that evening at the stereo shop. So let's talk about that attack and what we know about the robbery that took place at the hi-fi shop. Michelle and Stanley were working that night at the hi-fi shop. The attack took place just before closing time, which was 7 p.m. When two men entered the shop, they were armed. They tied Michelle and Stanley up and they forced them down to the basement. And right after this, Courtney Nesbitt is going to enter the hi-fi shop. Yes, he goes in there, and the story that has always been told is that he went in there to thank Stanley, who was working at the store that day, for allowing him to park his car in their parking lot, that he had some things to do in the area. He needed somewhere to park the vehicle. It was really just a nice young man going in and saying, hey, thank you for allowing me to park there that day. Unfortunately, he's unaware that the store is in the middle of a holdup during this time where the perps are inside and taking hostages. So Courtney walks in. He's very quickly controlled by the two men. He's led downstairs to join the other two captives. Then just before 9 p.m., Oren, Stanley's father, walks into the stereo store. He went looking for his son as he knew the store had been closed now by this time for almost two hours. When Oren walked in, he said that he saw no one, and in fact, he didn't hear anything either. He walked around for a bit, and then he got near the door that led to the basement when he was surprised by a man with a gun. The man told him to move it downstairs. When Stanley sees his father, he shouted something, You know, this caused a bit of a commotion. Stanley was kind of like upset. You know, he's upset that his father, he's now seeing his father there. And he's like, why did you come here? Why did you come here? This causes a commotion, which led to one of the assailants to fire two shots. This was not shots at the victims. This was two gunshots into the wall. My guess here, Captain, it's one of those situations you see it in movies all the time. You think you're losing control of the the hostages Mm -hmm. and you're firing what is likely warning shots to let them know hey i'm still the one that's calling the shots here i'm still the one that's in control everybody needs to settle down and let me do uh, let me carry on with what we're going to do here but these shots happen while they're in the basement but do we have any witnesses that hear these shots like outside the no, the no we, don't, store. we don't have anybody that has 
as far as I know, the only witnesses we ever have outside of the shop would be somebody nearby who said that they saw one of the victims in the in the parking lot, which right. would have been Oren who called in. To kind of clear that up, again, it doesn't really matter how they were found. What right. m- what my thought is on that, you know, because a lot of times people are going, and I say the same thing when I'm doing the research and say, well, why would you have two completely conflicting stories here? Well, one, this crime classification manual was written years after this crime took place. Mm-hmm. The newspaper account came out the very next day. And sometimes when they're reporting things, that's, they have limited information to report on. They're not really filling in the blanks. They're just reporting what they know at the time. My guess here, Captain, is it's likely that all that stuff was happening. Everything that is mentioned in both reports actually happened. And they probably all happened very close in time. So what we have here now is we have another person entering the hi-fi shop. And he's taken captive as well. So this is roughly two hours after they supposedly close. Mm -hmm. And now we have four people hostage. Correct. And these warning shots, if you want to call them that, this triggers the hostages to panic. And they start to plea with the captors. Michelle and Courtney the two youngest, they are begging for their lives. Oren and Stanley are taking a different approach here. They are trying to convince the men with the guns to just take the money, take any merchandise that they want, and telling them, hey, we won't be able to identify you. We don't know who you are. Or at the very least, we won't identify you. Right. Well, Captain, unfortunately, things will get worse. And I'm not really sure why these offenders would not just lock the door so no one else would enter while they're doing what they're doing. My guess is they need to carry out this merchandise, expensive stereo equipment. Mm -hmm. There is a back door too. So I can't say for certain, but as we know, there are five victims in this incredibly horrific case. So now we have victim number five enter into the store. This is Carol. By now, Captain, as you said, we have four persons already tied up and on the basement floor. Carol Nesbitt, Courtney's mother, comes into the store, and she, just as fast as the others, is taken hostage as well. Now, with five people tied up, one of the men instructed the other to get something from their vehicle outside. The man returns with a bottle wrapped in a paper bag. From this bottle, the man pours a thick blue liquid into a plastic cup. So one of the men explains that the liquid, explaining this to the the people that are tied up, Mm -hmm. that the liquid is vodka mixed with a German drug. Each of the hostages are told that they are going to have to drink this concoction. They are told that the concoction will make them and make all of them fall asleep for a while. And while they are sleeping, the men will be loading up the merchandise and then they will take off. When each of them wakes up, they will be fine and eventually they would be found and freed. Yeah. Well, damn. I wish it could have been just that easy, that simple. But as we know, Captain, from the long list of cases we've covered, we know it's just so very rare that it is ever that easy or ever that simple. Right. One of the men forced the hostages to consume the liquid. However, each victim, when they are swallowing this drink, they are coughing, they are choking, some of them so violently that they are spitting up the liquid from their mouths and noses. Now, Oren would be one of the last of the five that was forced to consume the liquid. So what he did, he saw and he heard the reaction that the others were having to this, what clearly, I mean, he's 43 years old. He's, he's an intelligent man. He's probably believing, Hey, this is not what they're telling me. It is, this is not vodka and a German drug concoction. That's just going to make us take a nap. Right. I mean, this would be hard to kind of tell though, because at first these individuals are taking this drink, they're spitting it up. That is something that could possibly happen. 
for somebody that is not used to drinking alcohol. But they're but, they're screaming and right, and right. Pain. But that's what I'm saying is like the initially, maybe the first couple coughs or the first couple spit ups. You're going, okay, well that's just you know this some kind of weird. You know, I'm trying to put myself in in their shoes. Oh, they're these guys are drinking this thing. There must be some kind of weird alcohol. This is not going well. But like you said, as it becomes more violent, and their reactions become mm-hmm. more violent. Mm-hmm. You you have to then decide: Are you going to put this in your mouth at all? This this could be poison, right? And the thing too is, three of our victims are rather young when you think about it: sixteen, eighteen, and twenty years old. I mean, they may have believed what these assailants are saying: that hey, it is this concoction. In fact, maybe maybe Carol and Orrin believed it at first as well, but. You know, Orn, as said, is 43 years old. He knows that if the captain hands me a shot glass and says, here, Nick, shoot this whiskey, and I do it, and I go, ah, you know, and I'm screaming. Right. That it's probably not what these guys are saying. Plus, it's it's always difficult. It's always damn near impossible to believe anybody that's pointing a gun at your face. And hold on real quick. I I just want to back up a second. Please don't do any more sound effects. That was, <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> I tried to get away from the mic so it wouldn't be so. So here's what we do, okay? Unbeknownst to the perpetrators, Oren is going to kind of fake consuming the liquid. Yeah. Right? He's going to spit the liquid out. He faked the coughing and the choking. Yeah. The liquid was not having the effect on the hostages that was desired by the captors. And then things turned very bad very quickly. When they tried to get Courtney to drink the liquid a second time, they poured so much that his mouth overflowed and the liquid came out and got on his face and ran down his, his, the front of his neck, uh, instantly burning the skin. Mm. After this, they began attempting to give each hostage a second dose, the other hostages a second dose of the liquid. This had similar results as the first time. Remember, we still have Orn, who has been about able to fake drinking the liquid and seems to be getting away with it at this time. Again, he hears the screams, the choking, and the coughing of the others, and he continues to imitate these noises and reactions that he's seeing and hearing. Right, but these captors, you got to think about the captors, like you said, whatever effect they wanted this liquid to have or this poison to have on their hostages it's not working Mm -hmm. like planned and so now they have to make a decision what are they going to do well i think that's why you see okay now here's the time for the double dose the the second round of this terrible blue liquid and when then the second round doesn't work now they're saying all right let's let's tape the mouth shut of the now screaming victims. You know, these victims are, our hostages are creating a lot of noise, a lot of commotion. We need to silence these people. Right. So they're going to attempt to tape the mouths shut of each one of these individuals. The other assailant at this time decides that he's going to untie Michelle and he takes her to another part of the basement where he rapes her. Now, some reports say repeatedly, I don't think we know for certain either way. There are some reports that say that this went on for about 20 minutes. And even worse, there are some reports that state not only was the other assailant, you know, there's, there's only one rapist in this two man group, but some reports state that the other assailant may have even watched the assault on Michelle. Yeah. Again, but you're standing by and letting it happen. It always drives me nuts. We we see this time and time again with a break into a house and a takeover of a house where that's the initial crime and then all these other crimes start happening on top of that. Like Like the individuals couldn't control themselves. Well, Michelle, after this attack, uh, is brought back to where the other hostages are and thrown down between two of the other victims. 
By this point, because of the thick blue liquid, the victims, most or all of them, are vomiting. One of the men is going to start executing our victims. It sounds like Courtney and Carol were the first two that were shot. Courtney saw his mother, Carol, get shot, and then he was shot and lost consciousness. Oren was shot, but this was not a good shot. Okay, there's, again, several reports. The bullet either grazed him or missed him completely. Stanley was shot next, and it's said that he looked at his father and told him, I've been shot, and then he went limp. Michelle, who begged and begged and pled for her life repeatedly, was shot. The men were gone from the basement for a while after shooting all of the victims. One of them returned, presumably, to check on the victims. Something tipped him off that Orn was not dead. So the man attempted to strangle him with a cord or a wire. Then the same man returned later, again, returning for a second time, this time with a flashlight, and he's checking Orin for a pulse. Angered that Orin was still alive, mind you, he is still alive, but this whole time he's been pretending to be dead, pretending to be dead by staying still and giving off the appearance of not breathing while you are in pain from having been tortured, your throat, mouth, lips, face, neck, shoulders, your skin is burning and you're forcing yourself to lay there still. He has been choked with a wire to which Oren positioned his neck. Later, we would learn that Oren said, hey, he positioned his neck and head and expanded his neck muscles so that he could still somehow get a little air while this guy was choking him. Now, this robber turned captor, turned torturer, rapist, and killer, someone just vicious and evil, he's checking for a pulse on Oren. And now he's angry that Oren is still alive. He grabs either a pencil or a pen and violently jams it into Oren's ear, to which he begins kicking it and stomping on it until the writing utensil uh, I'm starting to lose my words here. Oren can feel it bust through his ear canal and into his throat. Apparently, this satisfied the attacker because he then left the basement area of the stereo store and did not return. From there, Captain, we have to leave everyone with the two versions of how the victims were found. And again, my best guess is that they are both somewhat correct because both have Oren Walker's wife and other son arriving about the same time as police. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to everybody out there listening. Now, thankfully, because we have some survivors, unfortunately, we have three dead victims, but the two that remain alive, we have Courtney, who is in a coma, but then we also have Oren, who is able to tell police what went down and a general description of who is responsible and who they should be looking for. The Utah Highway Patrol said police were looking for the following. Two African-American males, both in their early 20s. One man is approximately 5 foot 10 inches tall, and the other man is thought to be 6 feet tall. They also have that vehicle description, looking for two vans. One described as a yellow late model van, and the other as a dark blue Chevrolet van. And we have a general description of the weapons used during the whole horrific ordeal as well. One of the suspects is believed to have been carrying a 22 caliber automatic pistol and the other carrying a snub-nosed 25 caliber automatic pistol. 
We see 22 calibers and even more specifically a 22 pistol or handgun in a lot of the cases that we've covered. What we don't see is hardly ever really is a 25. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was trying to think of a case that we covered with a 25 and really none came to mind. Now I do know of at least one infamous case that the serial killer known as the Grim Sleeper, Lonnie David Franklin Jr., he shot all of his known victims, all 12 of them, with a 25 caliber gun. He was apprehended in 2010. He gets the name captain because he took 14 years off between some of his killings. This was 1988 to 2002. Mm-hmm. Actually, while we're on it, I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but Nick Broomfield made a really good documentary called Tales of the Grim Sleeper. He was the man that made a lean life and death of a serial killer, which was one that made my top 10 list way back when we did our must see true crime episode, which was episode 197. Yep. 197 and came out in April of 2017. So download the very free, very awesome Stitcher app to listen to all of our old episodes, all of the old True Crime Garage episodes. So again, we have the description of the two perpetrators and the description of the vehicle. So the manhunt is on. You were saying that there's a description of two different vehicles. Two different vehicles, two different men, two different guns. Okay. And of course, as said in the trailer, the suspects are considered to be armed and extremely dangerous. We know by the crimes they've committed, they are extremely dangerous. So is the thought that they took two vehicles because it would be easier to transport whatever items they're going to steal from the hi-fi store? Well, that that's interesting. I don't know. I can't say for certain that they fully believe that both the vehicles belong to the perpetrators. Right. Because you got to keep in mind, where is this vehicle description coming from? Well, one could believe that it's possibly coming from Oren, who entered the store. Right. Or we've had in other cases, Captain, where there's other witnesses, you know, where we, we said that we didn't have any here, but we know that somebody called police with the unknown trouble call. Where this vehicle description came from, we can't for, say for certain. If it did come from Oren... You have to take it a step further and go, okay, either both of them are involved or maybe one or maybe none because Oren at some point is in the basement of the hi-fi shop. Right. If he's saying, hey, I think I saw these two vehicles on my way into the store, he can't say for certain when they left, right? Well, and can you clear something up for me because I can't find this information and I'm looking right now. I will do my best, Mr. Captain. Is this building like separate or is it a part of? Is it like a standalone building? Yeah, or like a strip mall. Okay, I, from my understanding, it is a standalone building. Well, because, okay, so because the only picture that I can find, it looks as if this hi-fi shop is connected to other shops. Okay. Uh, that would also make sense. One is called the dollhouse. Um, I'll post these pictures on Instagram at true crime garage. You're probably looking of pictures at, at the, of the time period. And one thing I will say when I was doing my research is this address that I came up with here, that's listed in the papers for the attack at the time, the newspapers that I went through didn't have any pictures of the actual shop itself. But I believe, you know, we we can imagine that the city's probably grown in the last 45 years. Right. I believe, I'm going off of memory here, Captain, but there is there is a very similar address where there's like a West Washington Boulevard now. And back then there may have just been Washington Boulevard. So I couldn't quite confirm. Both of them are, I believe, are currently businesses. So I couldn't confirm if the structure had stayed the same and which one was of this exact hi-fi shop but yeah it could be um more of a strip mall type situation again some of the stuff that i'm finding is um this is a hi-fi store but one of the pictures that keeps coming up is a high hi-fi store 
or called the Hi-Fi Shop, but it's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So they're just filling in a random picture yeah, to go with, with the story. A stock photo, is that what they call those? Yeah, and the only reason why I'm saying that is because maybe you get, uh, if there's a small parking lot that somebody from a different store parked there, you know, like an employee just used that parking lot. When I used to teach at the guitar store, Right, I, I parked in the parking lot of the building next door, so somebody would have seen my vehicle at that shop, but that doesn't mean I was in that shop. Right. No, you bring up a good point, and I think that at this time in our investigation in the manhunt, police aren't certain exactly what kind of vehicle they're looking for. They've somehow obtained the description of these two vehicles. They're going to include both of them out to all of their other officers, out to the newspapers to get the public involved. You're, you're going to include both, hoping that one or both were, in fact, actually involved in the commission of these crimes. Mm-hmm. But as we said in the trailer there, Captain, these suspects are considered to be armed and extremely dangerous. The state patrol and police posted several officers on guard at the hospital because there were a lot of concerns that the men responsible learning that two of the victims had in fact survived might go to the hospital and try to finish the job, so to speak. Well, and think about if you're the responding officer, you go to the scene, there's no hostages on the main level. You now go to the basement. You find the other four down in the basement, three are shot and killed. The other one's in a coma. But on top of that, you have to have some, like you were saying, that this this liquid that they drank, there has to, you were saying that it was burning the skin. And the victims were vomiting at one point. Right. So you have vomit all over the place. You have these marks that probably don't make any sense to you on their face. And on top of that, they're all executed. I mean, this would be a horrific scene to try to piece together all the puzzles of what the hell happened well and some of those details were left out of the next day's paper mind you they're still hunting for the the perpetrators at this time right look it, there's no doubt that these assailants were certainly dangerous but they really weren't on the run right they they were not intending on running or fleeing or, you know, going cross state lines. Really what happened is they were intent on returning to their normal everyday lives after killing three people and leaving another one in critical condition, barely alive in a hospital bed. Mm -hmm. After police gave the public the description of the two suspects, police received a couple of tips, right? One tip was from a man at the, a nearby air force base. This is Hill air force base. The man lived at the base. He was an airman and said that another airman, his name William Andrews, told him several months before that he and another airman, this is Dale S. Perry, were going to do something big someday, like a robbery. Then on a separate occasion, William Andrews told him, someday I'm going to rob the hi-fi shop, and if anyone gets in my way, I'm going to kill them. Okay. Again, if you're working with somebody that says one day I'm going to do something big, like rob the hi-fi store, maybe you you start by saying maybe you should set your goals a little higher. Right. I mean, who knows what what conversation was had after somebody says this. We know that a lot of times when something like this happens, often the other person thinks that the, the person's joking, right, or just saying something out of turn there. So. I'm going to rob the hi-fi shop, specifically references the hi-fi shop. And if anyone gets in my way, I'm going to kill them. Well, this tip, now mind you, you got to keep in mind, we don't know what this tip means at this time when it comes into the police force or to the task force. We don't know. Anybody can call in. We've seen plenty of cases where we have a divorced wife who's calling in some bad tip about their ex-husband or an ex-husband calling in some bad tip about their ex-wife right? because it's somebody that's mad at somebody and says, oh, they fit the vague description of whomever they're looking for. 
they're cap- oh, if they're capable of hurting me, they're capable of pulling this off. So detectives want to figure out, is there any validity to this actual tip? And they went to the air base responding to this specific tip. But before they arrive, another tip is called in, and it's from the base as well, or very nearby. But the tipster stated that two boys, well, for a back of, uh, lack of a better term, were dumpster diving. And in a dumpster located at Hill Air Force Base, they found a wallet, some purses, and identification, all of this belonging to some of the victims of the hi-fi murders in this dumpster. Right, which makes this tip seem a lot more credible. Right. So we got to kind of keep this all in real time here and understand that not always does the left hand know what the right hand's doing or the right hand know what the left hand's doing, right? So by the time detectives got there to the scene, to this Air Force base, a crowd had gathered in the parking lot around the dumpsters. The detective... And I tried my damnedest to find his name, but but could not, just like the, the picture of the actual hi-fi shop. There are two really good books that discuss the case, and the Wikipedia page is, is really good, too, and pretty thorough. But the newspapers and everything else just list this man as the detective who responded to the scene. That's didn't even get his name put out there, not even in the paper. Well, but I wonder if they did that on some level to protect this end of protect them from, yeah, from these very dangerous people, or does he hold a certain position at that department where we don't want everybody knowing his name and face, right? The books, by the way, are the crime classification manual. And this case is included as a sample case, just a few pages of a case study categorized as indiscriminate felony murder. That's a case study where, the investigating agency classifies a murder as indiscriminate because the offender, or like in this case, the offenders have decided they are going to carry out a felony and will murder whoever in the commission of that crime, regardless of victimology. Now I'm not an expert enough to know if the decision to commit murder has to come in advance of the felony or spur of the moment. My guess would be that both apply for that classification. Uh The other book is John Douglas and Mark Allshaker's The Anatomy of Motive, where this case is briefly referenced in a chapter very fittingly titled Magnum Force. At the scene, Captain, the detective stood in front of the gathering crowd at the dumpster and began pulling items out of the dumpster related to the crimes. This detective took some classes at Quantico and received some training from the FBI. John Douglas says the detective understood both the investigative techniques and the dramatic flair. We meaning his department at the FBI sometimes advocate if we feel it might help in hunting an unsub an unknown subject or an unknown perpetrator. Right. So the detective using long needle nose pliers pulled items out of the dumpster one at a time. And each time he's waving them. So the crowd could see them as his partner held open an evidence bag for each item. Keep in mind, technically at this point, the detectives have yet to identify their suspects by name, even though they've received some tips, right? He suspected the detective at the dumpster, he suspected that the perps may be in the crowd and like so many others, they wanted to observe what they could about the investigation. As you know, with Delphi, we have ISP Doug Carter, who says the famous quote, you want to know what we know. Yeah. I mean, again, we have five victims. Three of them are now dead. Mm -hmm. One's in a coma. So they're not talking. And we don't know, and we we can assume that these suspects don't know, they don't know the health conditions of the other survivor. So as right. far as identifying this person, if you don't know these individuals, this is going to be really hard other than, you know, a blanket 
um, profile. Yeah, I believe that the papers, the newspaper at the time, when describing the two survivors, simply said that they were both hospitalized, one in critical condition. So that doesn't give you much of a description, one. But then on top of that, keep in keep in mind, you know, just a few weeks ago, we discussed Paul John Knowles. And he was a real monster, a real piece of work who went around and he robbed and killed people. He didn't need to kill them, but he did. And he jokingly told somebody at one point later in his life, the only good witness is a dead witness. Well, that applies here, doesn't it? Because at the time we have at least two perpetrators. We have one, one victim saying, Hey, I saw two men. We, I was taken captive and the others were killed by these two men. These two men, the perpetrators left that crime scene with merchandise with money from the robbery, believing that they didn't leave anybody alive, right. believing that they had killed every witness that saw the crime go down. But but their other mistake is they took items from the victim. So when you get this initial call from the Air Force base saying, hey, some guys that I worked with talked about this, and then they, they go digging and they find items from the victims. If they never found those items from the victims, I think that becomes a dead end lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the common curiosity of the perpetrator of the unknown perpetrator that very often, yes, they want to know what investigators know. They want to trace and track the investigation itself because of many different reasons. But one that we've pointed out in the past is they want to know, maybe should I flee now or not? Should I take off? Is now a good time to go live in Alaska? Right. How hot? is the hot tub right it's getting pretty hot how hot is the hot tub this well-trained very intelligent unnamed detective he knew from his training that if the perpetrators were in fact in the crowd they likely would have some kind of visible reaction to seeing these items being taken into police possession this is now evidence yeah, what if he like pulled out each item and went, got him, <laughs> got him. Well, the detective decided he's going to, like he's he's adding flair to this. He's, he's purposely lifting every item up so it's well visible to the crowd that's gathering. And while he's doing this, he's watching the crowd to see if there is a reaction, to which he says he spotted two men who became visibly more and more agitated each time an item was bagged and tagged by the officers. At one point, he says the two men in the crowd were pacing back and forth and sharing like these menacing looks at one another as they're seeing some of these items pulled from the dumpster. Yeah, because one of the guys is given the look of, why did we take these items, you idiot? Not only that, if... You wonder, like, was it one guy's decision to dump these items in the dumpster? Right. And the other one's like, I told you that was a bad idea. Now look where we're at. It's the hot tub and it's getting hot. Yeah. Too hot in the hot tub. Police then decide, hey, let's interview these two guys that we saw becoming visibly agitated in the crowd, right? And eventually they learn the names of these men from witnesses but also from speaking with them. The one witness who called in the information about the, I'm going to rob the store. This is where they learned the name of Andrews. And he is cited as being the one specifically to have told this witness, I want to rob the hi-fi shop. And if anyone gets in my way, I'm going to kill them. After police arrested the two, the two guys from the crowd Then we have a third man who comes forward and he turns himself into police and says, hey, I'm here to talk to you about the hi-fi shop. I want to thank everybody for joining us here again in the garage. You mean so much to us, so much more to get to in part two. And until part two, be good, be kind, and don't litter.